<laughs> All right, so how's everybody doing? Like I said, the weather's cooled down a little bit. It's getting a little bit more bearable. Um, yeah, you know, AC doesn't have to be on as much as it used to be. Um, I still have it on. But regardless, uh, welcome. Welcome to news. And I, I do hope that you guys are encouraged today. And um, yeah, let's get into the word. So today we are starting a new series. Uh, we just finished up the book of Ruth. Before that, the book of Esther. Before that, the book of Romans. And now we're going into the book of Hebrews. Um, and yeah, when I got into this and I started preparing, I was like, what did I get myself into? This is really hard. Um, but regardless, we're going to get into it. And if you guys are wondering, I'm sort of dressed up today. Um, normally, I'm a lot more dressed down than this. People are like, what's going on? Um, I spoke at the youth ministry uh, before this in Korean. Um, <laughs> and well, <laughs> I, was like, I don't know. I don't know if they understood. I don't know if I actually said what I meant, what I was saying, but I did it. And so, thank the Lord, it's over. Um, but yes, that is why I am dressed up like this. Um, but for today, it looks like, okay, here we go. So, um, first question. Growing up, did you have some type of item that you kind of held on to or used for protection? Like an example of this would be like, um, you know, with Peanuts, with Linus, with his security blanket, right? um, Did any, any of you guys have anything like that growing up as a child? Something that you clung to for protection? Anything? <laughs> Nothing? A stuffed animal dog. You did? <laughs> what, was the, what was the name of the dog? Spot. Spot? Okay, Joe had Spot. <laughs> anyone else? Anyone else have have it, some type of item that they use for protection when, they were, when you were young? No one? Mirror. A mirror? Yeah, to look behind me. You carried a mirror around you? <laughs> and you like, <laughs> really? Yeah. Like at what age? Oh, I watched a horror movie with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so I carry a mirror all the time to check my behind. So never try to surprise Uk from behind. <laughs> okay, a mirror, a, a stuffed dog named Spot. Um, you know, I'm sure some of us else had some different things. But I just want you to think about, you know, when you use different items for, for different reasons, right? And so for many of us growing up as kids. Uh, we always felt this need for protection. So anyway, um, today we're actually going to talk about angels. And so we're going to go into Hebrews 1, starting with verse 1. So open up your Bibles, smartphones, or just look at the screen. Uh, Hebrews 1, starting with verse 1, where the Lord says this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Amen. Now our theme for this year is Transformers, understanding how the gospel continually transforms us and understanding how we are meant to be agents of change wherever God has led us to be. 
Um, next slide, please. And, and last, you know, the last four weeks we went over the book of Ruth, and really the theme of the book of Ruth was the hesed, the loving kindness, the unfailing love of God, and how he continued to provide for these different characters. And what was a very simple story that had simple acts of, of faithfulness led to amazing consequences. Now, there's a story I forgot to tell last week. I'll tell it really, very quickly. Um, you know, it, it relates to really the beginning of Christianity here in Korea. You guys know who the first Protestant missionary in Korea was? Thomas. Robert Thomas. Robert Thomas from Wales. Um, so this young man, Robert Thomas, I think he was probably in his 20s, he showed up in a boat. He never got off the boat. He got killed before he got off the boat. All he managed to do was throw a bunch of Bibles over the boat. That's it. Kind of a sad story. In the eyes of the world, people were like, wow, what a waste. Right? This young man in his 20s came all the way from Wales in a boat, threw a bunch of Bibles, and died. Um, but the, the legend of the story is, is years later when they started to send missionaries again, they found that there were already Christians in Korea. And so apparently, one of the, like, some of the people that had actually murdered him took those Bibles and used the paper to paper their walls. Right? And the, the paper on their walls being scripture, eventually they started to read it. And eventually they actually came to believe what was written on their walls and became Christians. And so that's, that's, that's the legend of the story. But something as simple as a man being faithful, coming to Korea, and all he ended up doing was throwing a bunch of Bibles over a boat, actually was, in many ways, the birthing of the Christian faith here in Korea. So like I said, you know, the, the book of Ruth is all about understanding how small acts... How, how steps of faithfulness can lead to even greater things. Next slide, please. Now, when I got into the book of Hebrews, um, there, there are two reasons why. I, I was debating about, are we going to do Hebrews next, or are we going to do the Gospel of Mark next? Um, and so I was debating between the two, and um, like I said before, I went with Hebrews because um, I was like, you know what, we've been doing Girl Power, we've been doing Esther, we've been doing Ruth. There's the thought that Hebrews may have been written, written by Priscilla, a woman. I was like, all right, let's stay with the girl power theme. Um, and then also, you know, if you know the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, which is the famous chapter about the hall of faith, right? And it goes through these different characters that, that have lived lives of faith and how God used them. I said, what a great way to finish this year, understanding how we can be like those people, how God can transform us into people like that. And then I started looking at the book of Hebrews after I chose it, and I was like, this is really hard. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Um, um, actually, there's a big controversy. Like I said before, no one knows who wrote this book. No one knows. Um, uh, uh, like Originally, a lot of people thought that the book was written by Paul because a lot of thought is like Paul. But number one, the Greek is too good. Whoever wrote this book was actually very, very excellent in how they wrote their Greek. Paul was okay, but he wasn't excellent. Paul was, you know, he was more more versed in, in, in Hebrew. And so, and plus, Paul, like I said before, whenever he writes a book, he always starts off with, I, Paul, a servant of God, blah, blah, blah. He always introduces himself. This book starts with no introduction. So we have no idea who wrote this. So it's not Paul. A lot of people thought it might be Luke because, you know, Luke was really good friends with Paul. He was a, he was a Greek, so his, his Greek was excellent. He was a doctor, a really smart guy. But we can compare it with the Gospel of Luke and, and the Book of Acts, and there's really no similarity. So a lot of people are like, can't be Luke. So then they're like, well, maybe Barnabas. Barnabas was you know, good friends with Paul. Um, maybe Apollos. Apollos was a very you know, eloquent man. It could have been him. And now recently they're saying Priscilla. And the reason why they're saying Priscilla is because what we can discern from the Bible is that Priscilla actually was more... Um, like more respected than her husband Aquila because the name order changes. It goes from Aquila and Priscilla to Priscilla and Aquila, right? And we also know that she was the one responsible for teaching um, Apollos. So Apollos was this very eloquent man who had a misunderstanding of the gospel. Priscilla took him under her wing and basically taught him the actual faith. And so she, she must have been a very good teacher. And so a lot of people think, maybe this is Priscilla. Bottom, bottom line is we have no idea. I have no idea who wrote this book. No one does. So the question is, how did this get in the Bible? <laughs> like, there's actually two criteria for all the books in the New Testament. Is that number one, it's supposed to be by someone who either knew Jesus personally or was very closely related to someone, uh, you know, connected to Jesus. 
And then the second thing is, it has to be spirit-filled. Like, when you read it, you have to feel like this is, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And even with that, they let it into the Bible. And part of the reason why was because a lot of the early Christian fathers quoted from the book of Hebrews. This was something that they used often in teaching others. But here's what we know from this book. Whoever wrote it was definitely much more, they, they were definitely Jewish, ethnically, but they were much more Greek than Jew. They were Hellenists. These were people, this, whoever wrote this was someone who grew up outside of Jerusalem and who was much more familiar with Roman culture than they were with Hebrew culture. This is also someone that you can sense probably didn't know Jesus personally because they tend to talk about Jesus from a bit of a distance. So this is in many ways someone who's probably a second generation Christian. So why do I say all this? If I want to put it in today's context for those of us that have Korean ethnicity, the person who wrote this is kind of like a Korean American writing to other Korean Americans in English. Okay? That's basically what it is. This is someone that grew up abroad, that understands the Jewish faith, and is speaking out to other people like him or her that, that have, this, have this Jewish faith and this Christian faith, but they're speaking to an audience that is drifting back toward Judaism and is actually leaving the Christian faith. So this is like me as a Korean American writing a letter to other Korean Americans to pull them back to the church, to the Christian faith, rather to than them drifting to, I don't know, like Korean shamanism <laughs> or Buddhism or whatever it is. Um, but that's kind of the context of what's going on. Whoever this person is writing to, these people are drifting away. They, they, they came to faith, they're second generation believers, they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, and they're starting to misunderstand who Jesus is. So a lot of what's going to be coming on in this book is, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is better than blank. Jesus is better than blank. Do not walk away from the faith. You're going to see this cycle again and again throughout this book. Next slide, please. So immediately, right when we get off into the first three verses, the first three verses are just jam-packed with theology, right? He's, this, this author starts proclaiming who Jesus the Son is and, and lists these big things, heir of all things, made the universe. So this Son pre-existed, right? This is a pre-existent being that made the universe, is the full radiance of God's glory. That, that kind of echoes to the Old Testament when Moses you know, proclaims, show me your glory, and, and, and only sees a glimpse of the back of, of, of God. And here, the, this, this, this passage is saying, Jesus was the full radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being, sustainer of all things by His word, provided purification for sins, obviously, on the cross, and now sits at the right hand of God. These are all very heavy statements. And what this author is making very clear from the beginning is, you got to know who Jesus is. You call yourself Christian, you're slipping away because you don't understand who Jesus is. Next slide, please. And all of a sudden it gets into this discourse about angels. It's like, what? Angels. So obviously there was a misunderstanding that these there were people that were either worshipping angels or saw angels as greater than Jesus. Next slide, please. Now, there's a bunch of quotes. I'm not going to get into them too much, but the, the author starts using passages from the Old Testament to ar make his argument. And when he's building up his argument, he makes two very simple points. Next slide, please. First, he's saying, angels are nothing more than the creations of God. Their purpose is to serve God and to worship Him. You are not meant to worship those that are created to worship God. They're supposed to help you worship God. Next slide, please. And then when he talks about the Son, and, and the passages he quotes from are mostly from um, Psalms. And so there are, a lot of them are from the context of David, and mostly from David's understanding from the Davidic covenant, the promise that God had made to David when God told him, I will make you a house that will last forever. And there will be this future heir, this future son of yours, whose reign will never end. So David understood this, and he proclaims it all throughout the Psalms. And, and, and this author is choosing from those Psalms, and he's making a clear point that this son is someone who's never changing. He will always be there. He will reign forever, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. So again, all, all this author is doing is basically taking what he said in the first three verses and using scriptures in the Old Testament that back that. He's building his argument. 
Why am I saying him? I don't know if it's a hit or she or not. The author <laughs> is building an argument and showing that this is who Jesus is. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. And you know, he's so much more than an angel. Next slide, please. So this begs the question, why would people have this problem? Like, why would you worship angels? Next slide, please. So when we think about angels, we normally think of like these type of very, like, you know, um, I don't know, what's the, what's the word to describe this? Um, you know, they're like, I want to say the word angelic, but that's just circular. So, <laughs> yeah, like, you have these angels that come out, you know, they, they look so innocent, they look so harmless, you know, you have that, that imagery of like, like, Cupid's not even, like, Christian, but, like, you have, like, you have, like, this imagery of, like, you know, angels, like, going around being benevolent, helping people, shooting arrows of love or whatever, and, like, you know, like, like, in America, we have, like, what, Charmin, the, no, the Angel Soft, Angel Soft, it's toilet paper, right, and it's, it's Angel Soft, <laughs> anyway, um, so, that is, is kind of our current, our modern understanding of angels as these very benevolent beings that are harmless, that are, are, are just good nature, right? Next slide, please. But if you look at ancient renditions of angels, they are scary. <laughs> like um, right here, this is a cherubim. Um, and this is actually, I think, based off of the description from the book of Daniel, if you guys remember Daniel from last year. Um, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what that looks like. And then over here we have the seraphim. Seraphim have six wings. And so, you know, there's a bunch of wings there. And so if you actually look at ancient renditions of what angels are described as, especially in the Bible, these are things that I would be terrified of if I saw them. Right? If this thing showed up, and I understand that, that this thing is actually pretty large. Right? If it was this size, it'd be maybe a little bit cute. But I think I would be like down here, basically, if this thing showed up. And, and so I don't know. If I saw something like that, like come at me and be like, yo, what's up, I'm terrible. I, I, I would probably run away. I would scream. Um, you know, Hook would throw his mirror away and just run. <laughs> and so, so, you know, angels were very awesome beings um, in terms of how they've been described biblically. And, and um, you know, like whenever an angel showed up in the Old Testament, it was a big deal. You see people falling to the ground and worshiping. Like they have no other response because of how awesome and amazing these beings were. They're nothing like our modern understanding of these cute little people with wings. Okay. Next passage, or next slide. Um, but when we actually get into other texts, we see, especially in the New Testament, that there are, are other texts that talk against the worship of angels. Paul in the book of Colossians, Colossians 2, specifically calls out you know, angel worship. And then John, when you actually get to the book of Revelation, which we studied for a year and a half, there are two times during the book of Revelation where John just like, just starts to worship the angel. In chapter 19 and 22, and the angel's like, get up. Don't worship me. I'm a servant like you. Worship God. Right? John himself, the apostle John, who knew Jesus personally, he himself felt convicted to worship a created thing. That is how all like how awesome the presence of an angel is. But even the angel reminded him, I'm not the one to be worshipped. Worship God. Next slide, please. So when I was really getting into this and trying to understand what is God trying to tell us when, when you see this comparison with Jesus versus the angels? Because what was going on was there was a lot of misunderstandings with this audience that they thought angels, because of how awesome they are and how powerful they are, how could Jesus, who was a man, be anything compared to these awesome beings? There was confusion. And rather than worshiping Jesus for what he truly was and is, the Son of God, they were shifting their focus onto created things. The angels, as awesome as they are, are nothing more than created things. And brothers and sisters, as I look throughout history and as I look at even today, we have that same tendency. Where rather than worshiping the Creator God, the God of Israel, we tend to shift our focus onto things that maybe seem a little bit more tangible, 
maybe seem a little bit more within our grasp, maybe something a little bit more that we could relate to? Because if you really think about it, in this time, next slide please actually, um, there, there was a thought that by, by praying to an angel that it gave you protection. Right? This is kind of where we get that, that thought of a guardian angel. So the thought is, you know, if you pray to an angel, they can protect you. And if you really fast forward a little bit further in the history of the church, when the Roman Catholic Church rose up, one of the things that it created, this culture that it created, was the prayer to saints. And in many ways, this is very similar, where you're praying to dead people. And you're praying to them because, you know, they have some type of impartation, some type of power, right? So, you know, that's the saint of healing, um, that's a saint of, I don't know, good weather for your crops. Um, that's a saint of, I don't know, good traffic. But like, you have all these different saints that if you pray to them, they imbue something, some type of, of, of benefit towards you. And in all honesty, that's nothing different than what these people are doing when they're praying to angels. They were praying to a created thing rather than the creator. Next slide, please. So what about today? We look throughout history, we see that in this early church, the author of Hebrews is writing to people that have shifted their way from Jesus to angels instead. Um, you know, I talked about how the Roman Catholic Church kind of shifted away from God and started focusing on, on saints. You could even talk about the Virgin Mary, and, and we're focusing on other things. But what about today? Where has our worship shifted today? Next slide, please. To me, we've moved away from the supernatural. Um, you know, for many of us, you know, Eastern society still clings to many things spiritual, but honestly, brothers and sisters, I really think much of what we celebrate now is human celebrity, right? Whether, you know, we just had the, we just had the, you know, Olympics, so there was a lot of, a lot of focus on, on athleticism, um, a lot of focus on ability, um, you know, like, th there's a lot of attention on, on certain individuals. Um, you know, you look at just, like, entertainment, and, and you look at, at how people focus on, on, on people of, of fame and, and, and ability. You know, I grew up in the States, and I thought it was bad in the States. I actually grew up watching Entertainment Tonight every night. <laughs> you guys know that, that show. Um, some of you probably don't, because I think it's still on, but no one really watches it anymore. But I used to watch it every single night. I liked that show. So that show told me everything about like all the celebrities. So I knew so much about their lives. And I don't I don't know why this fascinated me so much. And like I even um I, I remember in college I even subscribed to Entertainment Weekly, right? <laughs> EW. And so I was getting this stupid magazine that just told me about all these people's lives and you know it was interesting. And honestly like I look at, at the states, but I think Korea is actually much stronger in this regards, where there is an idolatry that happens to individuals. Right? Like it's, it's kind of crazy here in Korea that once you become famous, you take over everything. Right? Like there's only a, honestly, like there's so many people trying to be famous, but if you actually look at it, it's probably just a handful of people that are on every single show. I don't even know their names. I just know their faces because I see them all the time. Like those announcer guys, you know who I'm talking about? They're like, they MC every single show. I, I'm, I'm serious. Like, you, you flip through the channels and you see them on every single show. You're like, what's going on? And then like the way they do commercials, like, you know, you're like a CF king or a queen where you just dominate. And that, that's kind of the nature of like, when someone is popular, they are everywhere. And they are the attention of everybody. But brothers and sisters, Entertainment celebrityhood is, is a whole other issue in itself. What, what I think is more of an issue within the church is Christian celebrityhood. And that's especially a problem, it's been a problem in Korea, where pastors have become so important that people's faith seem to be more connected to an individual person rather than the God that they're actually trying to worship. For those of you that know American Christianity, very recently one of the Christian celebrity pastors um, kind of went through a bit of a scandal. Uh, Mark Driscoll, um, for those of you that, that follow um, Christians in the States. 
and he was, he's actually not that much older than me, just a couple years older than me, a very outspoken individual, and um, he became popular too fast. And the problem with what I see when, when we exalt people and we shift our, our worship away from God to these individuals, the inevitability is that individual will eventually fall. When you are in that position where everyone is looking up toward you, everyone is, is just waiting with, with itching ears to whatever you have to say, it's inevitable that you're going to make a mistake. And so, this is kind of the situation that I, I really feel that, that we've fallen into in the church today. Now, I'm speaking uh, mostly from the Western side because that's what I understand more. Um, but I know it's, it's just as big of an issue here in Korea. But in, in the States, like you have these big names like what, John Piper, um, Tim Keller. These guys have actually gone on record as saying, don't listen to us. Like, like some of them have even tried to remove their, their recordings from their websites because they're like, you know what? You should be focusing on your own local church. You should be worshiping God in your own context. The messages I'm giving are for my, for my congregation, right? Worship God, don't worship me. Yet at the same time, a lot of people will quote some of these people as if they are quoting the Bible. And in many ways, this is some of the things that I see here in Korea as well. This is what happens when you raise a church of a million people, raise a church of a couple hundred thousand people. It gets to your head, honestly. So for me, like, um, you know, the ironic thing is I'm the nephew of a pastor who was a, a very big celebrity pastor here, right? Uh, my uncle, Pastor Hong, was, was kind of very well respected, very well renowned. But the thing that I've really learned the most from him is that he always wanted to live humbly. Right? You know, the famous story is that, like, while everybody else were, were, were driving these nice cars, he was driving the Kia Pride. Right? Yeah. People would joke about it because he, he was kind of like my size back then. He's smaller now, but he was a bigger guy back then, and so he would barely fit in this Kia Pride. And like people would joke that like it would always veer to like one side because you know he was heavier, um, and, and so people would joke about these things, and and, and they would the like the church kind of felt like embarrassed. They're like, we want to buy you a nice car. What's wrong? Like let us buy you a nice car. And he would be like, you can't take away my pride. <laughs> so so you know that would be his joke. And he he would keep doing these things. And and the thing I've learned the most from him is even though he had in many ways every right to embrace his celebrityhood and to embrace his fame, he always chose the path of seeking more humility. Out of our entire family, he lived in the smallest apartment until very recently. Recently they built a house, but before then, he was living in this tiny apartment that he had lived in for, I think, probably like 20 years. And so to me, it's, it's just, it, it, I've had that model in my life of someone that could have chosen to embrace his fame but he actually chose to knock it down as much as he possibly could. So what I'm trying to say, because I've kind of gone off on a bit of a tangent, is that we have this tendency, even in the modern age, of losing focus of where our worship is going. Rather than worshiping God directly, or in this passage, as the author is trying to make clear, Christ is God, Jesus is God, you can worship Him. We're worshiping other things. Sometimes it can be individuals. Sometimes it can be um, different dreams or ambitions. But the reminder for us today, next slide please, is to not settle for counterfeits. Worshiping an angel is a counterfeit. Praying to a saint in many ways is a counterfeit. Worship God. Next slide please. And as the author makes very clear, Jesus is God. He is eternal. He will reign forever. He sits at the right hand of God on the throne. Worship Him. As the angel said, as, as the Apostle John fell onto his knees and was trying to worship this angel, this angel says, get up. 
Don't worship me. I'm a servant like you. Worship God. So for us, I think that's that's kind of the message is, where is our worship? You know, for us, it's very human for us to cling to things that seem more tangible, whether it's an object, whether it's a person that we can look towards, whatever it might be. I want to remind you to not settle for less. To worship Him. Next slide, please. So let's not be distracted. Let's solely focus our attention on Jesus and worship Him as the Son of God. Let's see some and pray. I want to take a moment to just pray into um, what possible distractions there might be in, in our lives. Well, what are things that have got, garnered more of our attention, more of our devotion than they probably deserve? Um, it could be individuals, it could be different ideals or, or different goals or, or pursuits, whatever it might be. I want us to really ask God to reveal to us, God, what are the distractions in my life that are taking worship away from you? Reveal these things to me right now so I would understand where I have been giving my worship rather than to you. Let's take a moment to pray today. Let's pray. things 
And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to see whatever distractions are in our lives or whatever things are keeping us from seeing or fixing our eyes fully onto you. And Lord, as you bring this revelation, may you also give us a fuller revelation of who Jesus is. How great and how awesome and how amazing he is and how nothing, nothing can compare to him. So give us that deeper, that higher understanding of your son. That your son alone would be fixed and reigning in our hearts. Help us, Lord. Encourage us in that way. Grow us, Lord, to fall more in love with you and all that you've done for us. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's time up time of offering. And as we have this time of offering, we give to the Lord what he has given to us. Sing your name. As morning dawns and daybreak fades, you inspire songs of praise. Praise God.